as gandhi said hate the sin not the sinner restorative justice is all about embracing the power of accepting and letting go the concept of restorative justice need to be understood and accepted as an adjunct to and not an alternative to criminal justice system thank you thank you mr ramakant a good evening to everyone and good morning and good afternoon for few of those in different time zones on behalf of cnsca and our event associates the federation of telangana chamber of commerce and industry and z zone china i take immense pleasure in inviting all the participants and for today's session on restorative justice and mediation distinguished and diverse participation is extremely encouraging and have been a constant source of motivation and support for cnaca in the traditional retributive justice system crime is demarcated by the violation of the prevalent criminal legislations of a country while retributive justice focuses on the offender being punished for the criminal committed restorative justice focuses on giving the offender the chance and opportunity to hold himself accountable for his actions to realize the gravity of his actions and if permissible be granted a way to right his wrong restorative justice takes into account that the crime against the victim is the harm caused it humanizes the criminal justice process when victims have the open door for direct association with the offender such cooperation can be transformative from enduring in silence to shared mending from detachment to network support from frailty to strengthening from melancholy to reengagement the focus of restorative justice is to repair the harm today the 2nd of october 2020 marks the 151st birth anniversary of the father of a nation the global leader for peace mohandas karamchand mahatma in his book titled the voice of truth offers his view on separation of criminals from the crime of the non violent type there will be crime but no criminals crime is a disease like any other malady and is a product of prevalent social system unquote gandhi also shared with us his vision of what prisons should resemble in india quote what should our jails be like in free india all criminals should be treated as patients and the jails should be hospitals admitting this class of patients for treatment and cure no one commits crime for fun of it it is a site should be investigated and removed we have had the privilege of owning this wisdom for over a country for over a century and a half demonstrated to us by the words and life of mahatma gandhi as gandhi said hate the sin not the sinner how does victim offender mediation work an unbiased third party intercedes an exchange among victim and the guilty party who talks about how the wrong doing influences them express their side of story build up a commonly acceptable compost comp compensation assertion build up a subsequent arrangement in this way empowering the agree of the system to justice is that victim offender mediation allows the victim who is directly affected by the crime to devise a personal restitute agreement the intention is not to let the victim individually decide what the punishment for the offender should be but to allow the victim to have a say in an outcome favorable to him or to his satisfaction thus restorative justice facilitates the victims one involvement in the process as well as the end result to be dealt with consciously and reasonably three an expression of remorse for emotional rebuilding four being allowed to take part in their case five monetary compensation six a semi formal procedure where they are valued 
This form of mediation and justice process gives a chance to the victim to recuperate from the deep traumatizing effect of the crime, mentally and emotionally, by allowing them to sit face to face with their offenders and talking to them at intervals convenient to them. This has a liberating advantage for the victim since it relieves them of the questions about the crime the offender. India does not have the laws relating restorative justice, but we have pockets within the laws. The best example is a list of compoundable offenses in the section 320 CRPC. We mainly follow the adversarial system in which one party wins and the, and the other loses. Restorative justice is a win-win for all. Our criminal justice system is largely focused on the offender. The system holds the offender accountable by punishing them. Focus on punitive approach deepens the chasm instead of bridging the gap. Remembering Mahatma Gandhi on his 155th birth anniversary, God help but marvel at this ideology. Be the change that you want to see in the world. On today's topic, restorative justice system and mediation, we have with us two of the distinguished personalities and immensely learned person in Dr. Federico Reggio and Mr. Stefano Cardinal, who have been who have amazing grasp on the subject, matched with the vast comprehension of human nature. They are known for the resourcefulness and quite reparty for the end of the topic today. May I a chance to to the speaker. Sarana, over to you. Of, uh, the Telangana Chamber of Commerce. So my warm greetings to one and all. It is coincidence that CNIC has chosen this topic, restorative justice system and mediation, on this day, being the birth anniversary of the father of Indian national, Mahatma Gandhi. Punishment is the standard response to crime, but punishment to the offender does not necessarily translate into justice for the victim. Restorative justice is based on the Gandhian premise that forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. The focus of the system is to heal. Towards this end, questions are asked, answers sought, problems solved, conflicts resolved, and the harm caused is repaired. Restorative justice is all about embracing the power of accepting and letting go. The concept of restorative justice needs to be understood and accepted as an adjunct to and not an alternative to the criminal justice system. To more in detail about the restorative justice system and as to how it practically works in various jurisdictions, we have two eminent personalities today as our resource persons. Mr. Stefano Cardinal got his law degree from the university in Rome. He earned various scholarships to specialize in international law, European Union law and international protection of human rights to do research for his final dissertation in Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. He earned his LLM at University of Barcelona <coughs> with a specialty in international practice of law and international trade law. In 2002, he specialized in European international fundraising at the Citizens of European Association. In 2015, he earned a master's degree in business law. <coughs> Mr. Stefano is a registered lawyer at the Barcelona Bar Association, Spain, and at the Rome Bar Association, Italy, where he practices international lawyer, professional mediator, cross-culture negotiator, and a conflict management consultant for businesses. He also practices international commercial law, international trade law, European Union law, Union law and international ADR, in which he has an extensive knowledge having practiced international mediation for the last 12 years in the USA, Spain and Italy. He has been external independent expert of the European Union Commission. In 2015 and 16, he was a member of the scientific committee of the Rome Bar Association Commission on International and European Fundraising. Since 2016, he is an international ADR consultant and master trainer for the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Government of India. Mr. Shafuna has been academic director of two LLM programs in ISD. University of Barcelona, where he has been also been academic director of a Spanish law program for foreign lawyers. 
He has been mediator trainers in the Indian universities such as Gujarat National Uni Law University, National Law University, Jodhpur, and Tata Institute for Sp Social Sciences. Mr. Stefana has collaborated in writing various articles and he co-authored co a book published in Italy by CDAM in 2011. Mr. Stefano knows many international languages such as Italian, English, and Spanish, and some basic Catalan. Mr. Stefano is a problem-solving oriented professional with great relational and negotiation skills, capability of team building, and team working together with a positive attitude towards life and challenges. He has been the guest speaker in international conflict management and mediation lectures in various organizations throughout the world. We once again welcome Mr. Stefano Cardinelli. The next resource person of today's topic is Dr. Federico Reggio. Senior research, Mr. Reggio is the senior researcher at the Department of Private Law and Critic Law, University of Badova, Italy, where he teaches legal methodology and philosophy of law. He is also a teacher and member of Scientific Committee of the Master International Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Strategies, Link Campus, University in Italy. He is currently a member of Scientific Committee of the European Forum of Restorative Justice and Scientific Director of Journal Mediaris. It is a journal on mediation, restorative, restorative culture, and conflict transformation. He is also coordinator of the editorial series Philosophy and Justice for Primary for Publishing Italy. Mr. Reggio authored several books and essays whose subjects span from restorative justice to mediation, from bioethics to traditional legal philosophy, with some recent socio political works dedicated to the history of the Silk Road. He is also a lawyer and civil mediator, and he has been frequently involved as a certified trainer and scientific director in courses for professional training of civil mediators in various parts of Italy. We once again welcome Dr. Dr. Federico Reggio. I, re I request Dr. Mr. Stefano and Dr. Reggio to take the digital layers to deliver their presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, you. Salavanan, sir, for the long and uh, exhaustive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am very happy to be here in this uh, forum, as I was uh, saying before. Uh, for a couple of reasons mainly. Uh, first of all, to meet you again, all of you. We've been uh, uh, sharing the, uh, uh, participating and while I was a trainer in IICA in the, in the master for, in the training course for commercial mediators. Uh, and second of all, because it is a Gandhi uh, celebration, Gandhi anniversary today. And as I was saying before, uh, my on the back of my business cards, there is that quote of Gandhi that inspired all my professional activity that says uh, lawyers uh, should bring the parties together, should not divide them. Uh, so that was the, the uh, concept of a lawyer that Gandhi had and, and I uh, share it and, and, and uh, have that the, sa the same since I've been starting my professional activity, I have that uh, object and that uh, mission in my professional activity. So I'm very happy to, to, unfortunately, not all lawyers are the same, especially in Italy, we uh, dealing with mediation and, and ADR, we, um, we know that many lawyers are exactly the opposite, unfortunately, at least here in Italy. But um, I can see that slightly and slowly ADR culture and, and uh, like conflict uh, resolution culture is uh, uh, getting ahead uh, in Europe and, and, and all over Europe actually and, and in Italy. Um, so we are, we are, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. So um, I will uh, uh, just uh, start a brief introduction on the topic and then I will let the floor to, to Federico who is a, a good friend and uh, uh, one of, uh, according to me, one of the biggest experts in restorative justice in Italy and, and maybe in Europe. But now, now he will smile, I know, but, <laughs> but I think, I think, I think it's, it's like that. So I will let um, him to go deeper in the topic. I will just 
uh, give a brief introduction. Let me see if I can share the screen. Uh, let me see if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, right. we can. Right. Okay, so um, just a, a quick uh, um, basic concept, because this is very important that we uh, are very clear on this. Restorative justice is not a process because unfortunately, all over the world, uh, uh, in some uh, situations, people do confuse restorative justice with criminal mediation uh, or victim offender mediation. So restorative justice is, uh, uh, I, I, I generally say that it's a change of culture. It's a new approach, a new paradigm. It's not a process. Right, so um, uh, uh, criminal mediation, victim offender mediation is part of, an, of a restorative approach, but uh, it's not the same uh, as, as many people uh, try, tend to confuse. Uh, as it has been already said, uh, restorative justice is, shift, is, is an approach that shifts from the concept of distributive justice uh, meaning uh, justice that tends only to uh, uh, make accountable the, the, the offender and punish the offender and put the offender behind uh, bars in order to uh, try uh, to minimize the risk of the offender uh, 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 doing uh, offending again or, or, or uh, making other, other crimes. Uh, restorative justice shift the, um, the focus on the concept of reintegrating the offender in the community and providing a restoration to the victim for the harm that the victim has suffered. Because basically, if you think about it, uh, in the distributive concept of justice, the victim uh, is, not, is not central. The central, uh, um, central position as the offender and the state, the community that wants to punish the offender, right? While in restorative justice, uh, we shift the concept from punishment to restoration and reparation. Uh, just a, a quick, uh, quick glance on uh, on a basic concept that is very important to, to understand and, and to understand how restorative justice has uh, uh, developed and progressed in Italy. We have a, a great limit in the Italian legislation uh, because the Article 112 of the Italian Constitution states that uh, the criminal prosecution is mandatory. Right, so uh, the, the uh, public prosecutor must activate the criminal prosecution. He has no choice, he has no choice, right? So this is the main um, uh, limitation that uh, restorative justice uh, development has in Italy, because uh, actually the, um, the, um, the alternative measures can only be complementary and never substitute the, the criminal prosecution, right? And the, and the criminal action by the state. Uh, but this is actually not true at all in practice because the problem is that we have a lot of, in the, in the, the public prosecutors are overwhelmed with cases. So basically there is a principle and a, and a practical application that is that they have to choose which are the cases that will uh, be uh, will have priority, right? Ba based on on specific uh, criteria, and so which means that uh, uh, the other cases will lie there for years, and and uh, although they are theoretically obliged to prosecute those offenders. Uh, the most probable is that the, uh, those offenses will fall into uh, statutory limitation, 
because they, they, get, they are not able to prosecute. So there is a, uh, since many years in Italy, there is a um, uh, debate on the fact that if maybe it's, uh, uh, it's suggestible and it's more practical to uh, step over and, and, and cancel the mandatory uh, criminal prosecution because it's not being applied anyway. So basically there is a system that is, that, that is collapsed and that is um, not very, very difficult to, to, to prosecute. So uh, basically the restorative justice concept and system lies on three principles, basic principles, meaning that there must be an interest of both the community, the victim and the offender to activate a process that can be many of them. I mean, we have a lot of, uh, in Italy, the main uh, process is uh, uh, victim offender mediation, but there are many, many processes all over the world. And I, I believe Federico will go a little bit deeper in this uh, that are um, uh, different from vic victim offender mediation, but they still lie on, on uh, they are inside the uh, uh, approach, restorative approach. We have uh, um, uh, uh, community conferencing uh, circles that are a lot used in the Northern European countries, uh, reparative boards. There are many, many processes that fall into the restorative approach uh, that are aimed to basically restore the victim of a, of a crime. And generally the restoration comes, especially when, when, when we, we talk about uh, juvenile offenders, uh, the restoration may come uh, mainly on the, in the fact that the victim can know by talking and by, by uh, uh, going through restorative process, uh, may know why the offender did, did that offense. Because as, you, as I always say, uh, when, when, if I, uh, I um, uh, walk along the street and somebody gives me a punch in the face, uh, I, I, apart from feeling shocked, apart from the harm, I am shocked because I don't even know why that person uh, punched me in the face, right? Or if a friend of mine directly uh, uh, jump on me and punch me on the face, this is not knowing why somebody did an offense to you. Sometimes it's even worse than the harm that you got from that, that offense, right? By knowing why, if, if I, if I did something wrong to a friend of mine and he starts uh, and we start fighting and, and, and he punches me, I know why he's punching me, right? So I, I, I it will be less, uh, I, I will be less armed by that offense than if I don't know why that offense has been committed. So knowing for the victim, uh, knowing uh, why that offense has been committed is a first step uh, towards restoration. And from the offender, offender side, the offender may be, especially for example, in, in uh, very uh, tense and delicate cases like uh, uh, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, uh, or those kind of uh, uh, um, uh, crimes that uh, generally uh, make the offender seen as a monster. Right? The offender is generally, in those cases, is seen as a monster. So uh, the possibility of uh, repairing and restoring the victim and getting reinserted in the community is a great part of the interest of the, of the offender to go into through a restorative justice process or, or mechanism. And the community 
generally has interest. That's why in Italy, normally the restorative justice uh, mechanism and approach has been applied mainly at the beginning, at, at, least, at least at the beginning, to juvenile justice. Because the community is uh, interested in having, uh, in, in trying at least, in Italy it's difficult because as, as you know, as I've already said, we have the mandatory application of uh, criminal prosecution. But in other countries where this concept is not there, for example, Spain has changed uh, its criminal code recently in 2015. And uh, um, in that case, the community may be interested if the offender is a very young offender, uh, the community may be interested in uh, reintegrating this that that offender and 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 trying to uh, make him understand the harm that he did, uh, trying to make him accountable for the harm that he did, and trying to reintegrate uh, that uh, offender through uh, uh, an alternative process instead of sending that uh, young uh, person to jail, where possibly. Um, it will become even worse because we know we all know unfortunately how jails are 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 driven and managed. So it's very there is a big danger on on the, for, for the community that that person will become a real uh, or, or a worse criminal than 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 it was before by going to jail. So so the interest must be of all the parties involved, meaning the victim, the offender, and the community. And that's why uh, restorative justice uh, uh, and criminal mediation are, gener are fundamentally voluntary. So victim offender mediation is just one of the approaches of a restorative justice, uh, one of the mechanisms of a restorative justice approach. This, is, this must be very clear because it, it's, it is often uh, too much confused, the term of uh, uh, victim offender mediation and restorative justice. I will stop here by uh, now and I will leave the floor to Federico and I will uh, get back to some practical examples of, of uh, 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 Italy and Spain uh, later on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, my friend Stefano. Uh, I could not imagine better introductions to my uh, brief presentation. I hope I won't disappoint you because uh, considering that I don't have much time, I just wanted to focus mostly on the idea and in a sense the ideal of restorative justice as a paradigm of justice, as you all reminded, and as an underlying philosophy, as an underlying conception of justice. Let me just start by sharing my presentation. I'm turning on the, the screen sharing. And just to say that I'm really honored to, um, to be here as a guest of CNICA. And I also do feel very much the importance of talking about restorative justice uh, in the moment in which you are celebrating and the memory of Mahatma Gandhi. And I mean, uh, this is not just um, an Indian uh, treasure uh, and heritage. We, we feel that his figure is a treasure and uh, um, I would say um, an example for all lawyers around the world and also for peace builders around the world. And just to say, I would like to start with an introduction which is placed in India. Um, and it's actually a long time ago, it's more than 2000 years ago. Uh, I, I took this couple of, of dialogues from a book, I, I hope I pronounced it well, it's the Melinda Panya, the, the question of King Melinda. Uh, Melinda is the Indian version of the Greek Menandros Menander, who was an Indo-Greek king uh, whose enormous kingdom was in, in north, northwestern India around, yeah, the, 165 and between 165 and 130 before Christ. And here's the first part of the dialogue, uh, which has nothing to deal, you would say, with restorative justice. Well, I will try to explain why, in my opinion, it has much to do with the attitude that we have to keep in mind when we start 
entering into the restorative justice world. Um, so let's start with reading this kind of, you know, the, 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 you probably know better than me the story. This king was a, a conqueror, was, uh, he was called a savior also because he was promoting um, a, a peaceful uh, atmosphere among his, um, in, in, in his kingdom so that, for instance, he adopted bilingual coins. So in one side you would have the Greek version and on the other you would have a Sanskrit translation. That is really a, a very interesting example of intercultural mediation. And among his most closest cooperators, there were not only Greeks, but also Iranian, Bactrians and Indians. This king was a philosopher and was frequently asking questions that people would not be able to reply in a satisfactory way. Uh, he was probably a very good rhetor and skilled in argumentation. Uh, and finally, he met this Buddhist monk, Nagasena, uh, who was very wise. And they told, you have to talk to Nagasena. He will probably be able to answer your questions, my king. And this is one of the first dialogues that they have in, in this book. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, Melinda says, Reverend Nagasena, will you converse to mean have a dialogue with me? I will converse with you, sire. I will converse in the speech of the learned, to mean the wise. But if you converse in the speech of the kings, I will not converse. And here's the question. What is the difference between the speech of the kings and the speech of the wise? Here's how the learned converse. When the learned are conversing, sire, there is a turning over and an unraveling of the subject. Then there is a refutation and an acknowledgement of the mistake. Distinctions and contradictions are drawn, yet thereby they are not angered. It is thus that the learned converse. And how reverse here, sir, do kings converse instead? When kings are conversing, they approve of some matter and order punishment for anyone who disagrees with that matter, saying, inflict a punishment on him. It is thus, sire, that kings converse. So you see, the true dialogue is a matter of recognition, of listening, of research for the truth, of being able to admit, in a sense, a mistake or to reframe definitions. It is an openness to a never-ending circle of research. While uh, the King's dialogue is more an issue of power, of being unable to uh, put into discussion certain schemes. And so wh what does that deal with restorative justice? Pretty much, I would like to focus on those words, a turning over and an unraveling of the subject, a refutation and an acknowledgement of mistake Distinctions and contradictions are drawn. Yeah, I'm not saying anything about the concept of restorative justice, but I think that this might help us introducing the perspective and the mentality that is required to understand restorative justice. It is thinking about predetermined schemes and roles, but beyond them, beyond a narrow idea of legal regulation, beyond the anxiety to distinguish right from wrongs in a mechanical way, to restore balances in an abstract way. In a sense, you could say that the wage that we find in the icon iconography of justice is a way to restore a balance, but it's quite an abstract way. It is thinking about law, even criminal law, more within relational textures rather than within issues connected with power, speech of the king, authority, formal application of rules. So restorative justice has much to do with rethinking the issue of crime and justice. So if we clarify this, uh, we have to find some sort of openness of mind. And this is the prerequisition that we need to have to start talking about restorative justice. And this is my first image. There is a second, which is even more, I would say, uh, fitting to the subject, and it's still from the Melinda Panya. Menander is worried because as a king, he has to take some unpopular decisions. He has to 
be a conqueror. He has to defend his country. He has to adopt punishments, all those things that somebody who has an authority has to do. And he is, in a sense, worried about his own personal responsibility, both in a human way, but also in a transcendent way. So there is much of a religious issue at stake also. But, but this is not important for the case. I, I would like to focus on this thing. So Melinda asks to Nagasena this question. You say that a man who has lived an evil life for a hundred years can, by thinking of a Buddha at the moment of his death, be reborn among the gods. And that a good man can, by one bad deed, be born in hell. So it's about having responsibility that are to be brought forever in a sense. These two things I do not believe. He's skeptical about this. And this is the issue. Would a tiny stone float on the water without a boat? Asks Nagasena. No. But even a cartload, a thousand stones, would float on a boat. So you should think of good deeds as a boat. Let's think about how the offenses that often happen when there is a crime happening as stones that can really make people drown, both the victim, the offender, and in a sense, their own entourage of relationships. And there's a big issue here. Actions, harms involve responsibility, which is what, what, is about, what this question is all about. But there can be ways to deal with them in a way that does not add harm, but takes care of a reparation. So in a sense, uh, my, one of my last uh, publications is called Melinda's Boat. <laughs> and my idea of restorative justice is about building this boat that can carry those stones. Uh, this is not ignoring that they are stones. It is about giving a different meaning to them. So the big, the big, big issue that lays behind this dialogue is a big issue within the whole culture of criminal justice. How can we respond to injustice without imitating its logic? Criminal justice has often fallen into the risk of imitating violence albeit uh, under different explanatory patterns. We have the big theory of retribution. So you are restoring an order through proportionality, but it's still an afflicted way of thinking about punishment. There is a theory of deterrence, the idea of protecting a legal, social, political order, a given order, by showing that law breach is not worth the while for the offender. And then there are all the theories that move from rehabilitation to inhabilitation. So the, the, the underlying concept is punishment is aimed at removing the causes of antisocial behavior. And of course, as it happens in many modern democracies, like in Italy, for instance, our criminal justice systems have often a mixture of these three theories in, in our constitutions and in our criminal justice systems. So we have mixed systems, but there are common things. As the introductions already remem remembered, there is the idea that crime is a conflict between the individual, the offender and the state, or at least the legal order. There is the idea of reconstructing a legal order in a formalized way. It is an offender-centered model, quite abstract and formalistic. I found this sentence, I think you know it very well. An unjust law is itself a species of violence. Now, the law of nonviolence says that violence should be resisted not by counter violence, but by nonviolence. I'm quoting Gandhi. So, the big, the big, big issue of um, restorative justice in a philosophical way is to understand the structure of violence that is embodied in the criminal behavior and to sort out some, some answer that is not imitating that kind of violence by imposing a 
suffering or by imposing something that is anti-dialogical, anti-intersubjective as the criminal behavior was. And this is philosophically a big, big issue. But is that so new to our culture? I mean, in European terms, that, that's the culture I, I best know. I can say that in pre-modern times, there were many approaches to the criminal justice that were open to a sort of reparation and a community justice system. We found it in old Roman law, for instance, in the old Germanic law, in this area of Italy, I'm in a Germanic area from, actually, I think I'm one of the, the few here is that, that only speak Italian. And, and, and well, of course, you, everybody speaks Germans here, but, but, but here in the German area, there was an underlying German law that was uh, quite open to a restoration between family groups. But I'm talking about pre-medieval times. But going back and going back, the Greeks, new uh, sort of community restorative model of justice. And there is this wonderful image in the Iliad that you know was written in seven, 700 before Christ, but talks about uh, a, a legend or, or facts that are placed between uh, 1,500 before Christ and, and maybe 1,200. So it's all really a null history. At a certain point when the poet describes the image of the shield of the warrior Achilles, there is a, an interesting description of a legal process. A process. And it is described like this. There are two people in the, at the center of a circle. They are discussing about the restitution for a homicide. The word is interesting because it's poine. It's the same root of Pena, Italian, and punishment, English. So you have the very same root. But the poine in Greek is not a punishment given by the state. It is a sort of monetary restitution that you have to give to the family of the victim to avoid revenge, to avoid vindication between family groups. The circle is formed by the elder, in a sacred circle that expresses both separation and protection. So you cannot directly act against the offender or the crowd that is out there that witnesses the public, public dimension of the process is not entitled to talk or to stone directly, to do justice. No, they are just there to witness what happens. But the circle and the guards are there to maintain a separation because that fact of blood has created a, a breach among the community, but also there is a protection for both the victim and the offender. And they have to talk. So the idea of the process, way before we have this idea of the modern justice legal process is to enable people to avoid violence to stop the circles of violence and to start talking to be put to be habilitated entitled to dialogue well let's move from ancient times to what happened to be probably the big bang moment of restorative justice, the famous Elmira case, I'm sure you all heard about it. It happened in Canada in the 70s. And it's probably the first victim offender reconciliation program. It was, I heard that story when I was in, in the US because you know, I started, uh, I took some classes with Howard Zare, which is the great the grandfather of restorative justice. And so I heard from his voice this story and that was interesting. You probably know it's a story of a crime uh, that was done by young offenders, not juvenile, but young offenders that destroyed, say, say 20 properties during a night when they were drunk and wanted to have fun in, in a quite violent way. And of course, after they were arrested, they would easily go into a plea bargaining procedure. So they accept their responsibility and try to make some sort of bargaining on the punishment as it frequently happens in the uh, system of common law. But that community that was a Christian Mennonite community uh, during the Sunday said, listen, if those young people go to jail, they will 
undergo violence and they will probably exit like worse offenders and the community and the victims will not have any kind of restoration to what they suffered from what can we do let's make them talk to the victims and of course the judges and and and, and the probation officer were, were a little bit skeptical but they tried and they organized meetings between victims and offenders and tried to sort out an agreement on how to repair the damage that was not just monetary reparation it was also symbolic you buy me a new dog you come here and build again the fence of my garden and whatever of course this had to be also integrated by the judges decision and by the public prosecutors public side of the punishment but at least this was an agreed upon reparative solution and uh, i would like to un to underline the, the questions that were coming from that issue how do we address the harm to people and to the community it is not just an offender centered idea how do we promote an active responsibility for offenders what does justice require? And the lessons learned from there, and I, I would like to remember that at that time, the term restorative justice did not really exist. There were some publications that were talking about a restorative way, but it is not the time of the birth of restorative justice. So it, it is a sort of bottom up phenomenon that was before a process. But the lessons learned helped creating the notion of restorative justice. So let's see the lessons. Crime is more than law breaking. Crime is more than a conflict between an individual and the legal system. Crime and the reaction to it involve rules, behaviors, people and relationships in a complex way. It is much more than retribution or deterrence. And then we come to the 90s where people like Howard Zaire created this paradigm of restorative justice. I'm quoting the book, Changing Lenses. And as you all know, because it was already said in the introduction, uh, at the very beginning, restorative justice was focused in opposition to the traditional justice system. So uh, different questions. It is not about what rules have been broken, who did it, what do they deserve in the forms of retribution, deterrence, or rehabilitation. Restorative justice is about different questions who has been hurt, what are their needs, who has the responsibility to make things right to restore relationships. Different questions lead to a different perspective. This is all about changing lenses, it's about changing the way you look at crime and the answer to crime. So uh, the main claims of restorative justice was to rediscover crime as an experience with personal, interpersonal and social implications against the legal abstractions. Just to give you an example, if somebody steals in something into your house, of course it's a crime against property. But if you look at your experience, you don't just feel that your property has been violated. It is your intimacy. The idea that at home you are safe and usually victims of those kind of crimes wash everything because they feel that nothing is clean. So that is an experience centered idea of crime. It emphasizes a relational dimension of justice and refers to an experienced dimension of sociability. So you see, it is about changing the iconography of justice, the modern perspective depicts justice with the famous wage, the restoring wage, the third to mean the law of the king, the power, and it is blindfolded. This is a pretty interesting but dangerous concept because it, it, it aims at impartiality, but this is a way to think impartiality in terms of its indifference. If I'm blindfolded, I'm also blind. In Roman and Greek times, it was the luck that was blindfolded. It was about a fortune, but justice had her eyes open. So restorative justice has to take away the third and open her eyes, directly looking into the face of the people involved. So this is a powerful image that we can draw also from art. 
you know, uh, Howard Zare in his first definition, I, I'm quoting for the little book of restorative justice, uh, said, well, restorative justice is based on a common sense understanding of wrongdoing. And these are the three basic principles. Crime is a violation of people and interpersonal relationships. Violations create obligations. And the central obligation is to put right the wrongs. Uh, I would like to suggest a more articulated definition. Uh, restorative justice is an approach to justice that considers crime mostly in terms of harm to people and relationships that generates the obligation for its perpetrator to put things right, to say, to repair the harmful consequences of his or her own conduct. And to do that, you need to actively involve victims, offenders, and their communities, and the civil community as a whole, in search for solutions, possibly by mutual agreement. Uh, Stefano, I already said that, but I would like to focus on what restorative justice is not, just to make sure that we are all clear. Uh, and just to make sure that I'm on time, how much time do I have uh, to, to, to finish my presentation? I'm asking to the chair. Dr. So you can Anna. proceed. Soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, how, thank long you will be taking, how long will it be taking? Because Stefano has to uh, give his... Uh, yeah, I know. It, it depends on you. I, I can cut it short in five minutes or ten. Is it is it correct? No, go, on, I, I, go, go on. Don't worry. Go, go, on, on, sir. go on. You go on, okay. sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then thank in case so I'll much. leave something for the questions. But uh, it is important not to make confusion because restorative justice is is something that sounds alternative and in this world everything that is alternative is quite appealing especially in times in which we all are not really satisfied by our criminal justice systems so but we have to be careful not everything that is alternative is good and you have to be careful of what alternative means so first confusion restorative justice is not primarily about forgiveness and reconciliation these are moral issues, maybe religious issues. They can be facilitated after a restorative process, but it's not the goal of restorative justice. The goal of restorative justice is not forgiveness, it is justice. Forgiveness is something that can happen if things are repaired and, and, and if the meeting between victim and offenders sorts out some moral issues but it, it cannot be mandatory and it's not a matter of justice to promote forgiveness. It is not mediation. Uh, Stefan already said that. I, I will try to, to make some points later on. You can try to apply a restorative justice paradigm through victim offender mediation, but this is not the only way. You, I told you about the victim offender re reconciliation programs, there, there are restorative circles, there are circle processes, many models. And I would like also to tell you that uh, one thing to avoid is to think about restorative justice as something that can be legally transplanted from one context, from one legal system into another. This would be a mistake. It, it has to be a bottom-up phenomenon, context sensitive in your own culture. But of course, to do that, to have that flexibility, principles and underlying philosophy must be clear. So if principles are clear, you can be flexible. But if principles are not clear, your flexibility will create confusion. So it's not a blueprint. It's not an Anglo-Saxon thing. It is not just for minor offenses. It is not for juveniles. And it's not a panacea for, or a replacement of the legal system. Because if you, if you need a legal system, what, how would you define a crime? How would you define somebody as a victim and as an offender without a legal process, with, without a legal code? So it's not about throwing away the baby with wash water. You need criminal laws, but you need to rethink the idea of law in a more relational, and contextual way, which is something that belongs to many ancient traditions. The Dharma has the same root of the Greek Themis and, and probably of the Roman Fas, the relational contextual ideas of justice that happened to inform our old ideas of justice. So it's not about mediating and negotiating. There can be a mediative process, but uh, you cannot think that everything can be sorted out by 
a meeting and by an agreement. Not all crimes are feasible to be treated with a meeting between a victim and an offender. Think of sexual harms or other types of harms. And it is not always possible to find a victim. It is not always possible to find an offender. So you can have some reparation, some restoration without an encounter. And you can have an encounter that doesn't sort out a reparation. So it's more a continuum. It's not a means of rehabilitating offenders or vindicating victims. And this is the typical Italian problem. It's not a way for deflating the criminal justice system. So this ADR idea, it is not. If you want to do restorative justice in a qualitative way, you don't have to have in mind that you're saving time for the legal system. You are doing something with quality and hopefully on time. So uh, restorative justice aspires to be a paradigm of justice. It has a global attitude and it's intercultural, but it's based on normative proposals. So the big issue is the ethical underlying ground. How do you address personal needs? How do you foster a more active responsibility? How do you promote active, constructive and respectful dialogue among stakeholders? How do you think about harming? How do you think about dialogue? And there are issues, especially in, in, in Western countries about that. How do you assure the certainty of, of punishment in a system that takes case by case? Uh, you are some way blurring the difference between civil justice and criminal justice. And there are authors, I am one of them, that think that restorative justice is a way of civilizing criminal justice. But it's a matter of civilization, not of civil law only. And usually the, the reparative goal is seen as an easy way out, and it is not. If you have to take care of the harm that you did, it might cost more than going to jail. It might cost more in moral and economic and personal terms. Okay, I'm going just to briefly conclude. Uh, there are other things that we can talk about later. Um, I would like to tell you just as a conclusion this thing, that those premises, those philosophical premises, and this is the problem of our Western countries, require a strong idea of person, of relationship, of law, as a means for enabling interpersonal relationships. And we in the Western countries are uh, currently in this postmodern milieu that is avoiding any kind of foundational context and concepts. So the problem is quite philosophical. What is there law for? Is it just something that we have? Or isn't it the big issue? The question that the people in Enmira asked is what does justice require? And this is the question that we all as lawyers have to ask ourselves and to face the challenge of restorative justice as a new way to think about crime and justice. Thank you. I'll stop by for the moment. Wonderful, Federico, as always. Thank you very much. Really inspiring. Um, uh, I don't know if we have uh, uh, more time or not. I can't hear you, Anand. You are, you are on mute. Uh, you can proceed. Okay. So just very quickly, uh, and then we'll ship, we'll go to, uh, to, to the questions and answer uh, part. Uh, just briefly, because we, uh, myself and Federico, we collaborate with a center that it's called uh, uh, Center for um, uh, research on the interpersonal relations. Uh, it's called crisi in the in Italian. Very difficult to 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 translate it to English, but it's very active in the in the restorative uh, justice area, and they've been starting uh, since 2000. So it's 20 years that they that they uh, uh, are a main uh, player in the restorative justice field in Italy. So they started uh, in, in the year 2000 with the uh, uh, Victim Offender Mediation Service uh, for uh, juvenile offenders. 
uh, and then they shifted to uh, um, to adult mediation, adult offenders. Uh, but basically, uh, as we said, uh, um, uh, because of the fact that in Italy uh, uh, criminal prosecution is mandatory, uh, uh, so the only way to uh, bring uh, uh, victim offender mediation uh, to a real stage and so to, to, to actual uh, meeting between, uh, uh, between victim and offender in the, in the, in the outside of the juvenile, juvenile uh, area, juvenile offenders area, uh, uh, they did it through a restorative approach uh, meaning that they, uh, for example, they, what they do um, recently is they uh, um, uh, bring offenders uh, that are in jail through special programs. They, for example, they uh, allow them to work um, in, the, in the agricultural uh, fields or to produce, for example, uh, local uh, food products, uh, uh, to work on uh, a kind of uh, uh, activities that are useful for the community so that they're uh, uh, like um, in, uh, to reintegrate them into the community and only after this long process when they are uh, uh, they have uh, ended their punishment and so they are free again out of jail in some cases through this, uh, 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 at the end of this long process, they are able to meet uh, their victims and so uh, to, to uh, really start uh, a victim offender mediation process. Or, for example, um, what they do, that is also very, I find it very interesting, uh, they uh, once once uh, uh, the offenders have uh, ended their 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 uh, punishment period and they are free of jail again, uh, what they do they allow them to meet uh, victims that are not not the, their specific victim of their crime but victims that have suffered the same uh, crime that they that they did the same type of crime that they did right so that they can. Uh, experience from a real uh, point of view, from a real uh, perception, what is the harm that they created to their victim that possibly in that specific situation is not, is not willing to meet them, but they can be, uh, uh, they can really touch uh, with hands, with, which is the harm that they did to their, to, to their victim. So there are many, many processes that, that, uh, that have been carried on um, in Italy. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in other countries like, like in UK or in countries where, where uh, criminal prosecution is not mandatory, what happens sometimes in juvenile justice, for example, I've seen a, a video of a, of a restorative process where um, uh, juvenile offenders that had set on fire uh, uh, trash bins. Um, instead of sending them to to to, jo to like juvenile detention centers, uh, uh, they uh, entered into a, a restorative justice process, and they had to uh, uh, be trained as firefighters, so that they experienced. Uh, uh, from from a real perspective, what uh, are the risks of being a firefighter, uh, and so what are the risks of uh, uh, um, uh, trying to uh, 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 stop the damages that they've been doing with by by setting on fire uh, trash bins, right? So all these uh, 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 all these kind of uh, techniques and 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 mechanism. Uh, like, for example, the conferencing circles in the, in the, in the north of Europe, are aimed to uh, allow the offenders really feel what, the, what is the harm that they did. Uh, and, and just a final concept, Spanish, we, we talked about that before. Uh, uh, recently, they modified the Article 84.1 of the Spanish Criminal Code in the sense that uh, the... Uh, public prosecutor uh, um, 
in agreement with the judge, uh, they can divert and stop the, the criminal proceeding uh, if the, uh, the offender and, and the victim are uh, willing to go through a victim offender mediation process. So actually in Spain, uh, now they have the possibility, there is a great development of criminal mediation and victim offender mediation because of this legislative uh, approach that allow uh, victim offender mediation. And final concept that just to wrap up, which is, I believe this is uh, really uh, inspiring. I, I, in, a, in a conversation that I had with uh, one of my mentors in restorative justice, which is Anna Devana, which is the president of this uh, crisis center that Federico knows very well. Uh, she told me that she's been working in this field for, for, for many years. She said, finally, what we, what we acknowledged is that we all do harm. Meaning that it's not true that every action that we do, even if we are not criminals, right? An action that I do can harm somebody or any action that, 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 that I do potentially can produce harm to somebody else. So the challenge of, of, of restorative justice today is to educate the community to restore, educate the community to be inclusive and to switch from a, a, an approach of um, uh, punishment and imposing uh, sanctions and penalties to an approach uh, brought to rehabilitate the offenders and, and, and reintegrate them in the community. For this reason, recently, uh, uh, me, Federico, and some other professionals, we constituted, uh, we incorporated an association that is called We Solve, that approaches this kind of uh, uh, processes, both in restorative justice and in, and in mediation and conflict management, out of a, a, a determined scheme of mediation. Uh, it's just an approach, a new approach, because as we were saying with Federico yesterday, discussing uh, uh, about this, uh, actually the restorative approach can be brought to civil mediation also. In many civil mediation, we've seen the need of the restorative approach. If you think about, for example, medical malpractice mediation, which is uh, uh, one of the mandatory fields in Italy uh, in which mediation needs to be, be carried on before going to court. In those, in those cases, uh, restoration is the, in, is, the main, is the main concept. Uh, if you, uh, if because of a medical malpractice, a woman cannot have, any, cannot have kids anymore. Uh, restoration from the harm, there is no, actually there is no reimbursement that can be, that can be sufficient for that. So restoration uh, of the harm done caused by that medical, medical malpractice is fundamental. And it's a civil mediation, but still restorative approach needs to be there because otherwise she will never agree to any uh, reimbursement or any sum of money. She will never be satisfied if there is not a restorative approach, if there is not a, 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 um, if there is not a, a real understanding of which has been her harm in that case. We believe this cultural change will come. Uh, we, we, are, we are working strongly on that. And so I hope that uh, we will be, thank you. I will conclude here. Uh, thank you for, again, for the opportunity. Uh, and, and I hope that uh, we will be soon in India uh, delivering uh, or, or, or in an event about restorative justice. We uh, strongly hope so. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I'll leave the floor to Anand. Yeah, th there are certain questions in the chat box. Right. There are certain questions in the chat box. Lot of appreciation on the presentation. 
In fact, uh, it was a very, it was a real spellbound presentation, very lucid presentation. It exhibited innate brilliance. I should thank both Stefano and Federico for such a wonderful session, especially on Gandhi Jayanti. There are a few questions on the chat box, which probably, if you permit, I, I can read it out to you. Can you take the questions? Uh, Stefano, shall I read the questions? I think you are on mute. You, you, you need to unmute yourself. Excuse me, yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's one question from Chandrasekhar Ramarao. He's the principal of Jain Law School, Bangalore. In my view, he says... First of all, beautiful city, Bangalore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so his question is, he wants your view on, in my view, on the rights of various freedom, jail must have only rarest of rare, deadly criminals of habitual nature and offenders like traitors, misappropriation of finance, culprits, Others must must have to let free by tagging them with grade wise iron bangle or the risk. What is your view? Uh, it, it's for me or? It's for both yes. uh, uh, The jail should be restricted only for people who have done major offenses, and others should have been graded, it should be tagged and graded as per the reference. He wants your view on this. You are on mute. Fed, you are on mute. You are on mute. It was not up to me to unmute it. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Briefly, yes, in a sense, the, the idea would be to reduce the amount of, type of types of crime and types of people that go to jail. Uh, types of people, I mean, types of criminal, it, it's, it's a bit difficult to say, but I mean, to, to leave the jail, the prison as a last resort issue. But I would say two things. Even uh, an imprisonment could be transformed into restorative terms. If, for instance, that offender is allowed to work and to do things that could be dedicated to the reparation of vic to, to victims or to associations that deal with victims. So I'm thinking about a very serious offender in Italy that wanted to work and give all the money to an association for victims of crimes and that did not ask for any reduction of his punishment. I'm thinking about the terrorist that I came to know, uh, a terrorist in the 70s, that wanted to have all the punishment he had, but also wanted to do something to repair. So also you can think of uh, the imprisonment in restorative terms. And I will tell you also another story that, that comes from Georgia in America. There was an offender that was offered to do some restorative action from a mother whose son had been killed by this man. And it was a racist crime because this was a black woman and her son was black and this was a white guy. And he said, okay, you killed my son. Nobody, nobody will bring him back to life if we kill you because it was about death punishment, death penalty, you know. I suggest that you take care of me and you bring me to Holy Mass every Sunday and you come and know this community that you so much depreciate. And he refused, he refused. That was a worse punishment than death. But after a long mediation, they sorted out that he would go to prison and from time to time take care of that mother. But just to show you that in that case, uh, for that person, the idea of taking responsibility of his hate was even worse than death penalty. Uh, it, it's food for thought. I'm not giving any answer. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Federico's approach. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to, to state 
uh, exactly. We are uh, coming back to the uh, 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 like uh, legal boundaries and to the uh, preconceived schemes in which, uh, for example, uh, uh, a little theft should uh, be should go to restorative justice and uh, and a homicide should not. But that is not that is not the the real aim uh, of restorative justice. Uh, the basic principle is that in any case, and that that was uh, what Howard there was was saying, as Federico mentioned, uh, restorative justice is not limited; is not something that should be applied only to Minecraft. Because it depends. I'll, I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you an example, a, a clear example of a, of, a, of a restorative justice process that that I, I witnessed. Uh, uh, this case was a case of a, of a guy who uh, uh, killed another guy in a in a fight uh, in a bar, right? Where where a fight started. Everybody was drunk. It was uh, Saturday night, and he didn't want. He didn't aim to kill that guy. It was not, uh, it was an accident. He pushed him strongly, he fell down, it is said, and so uh, if we start from BI to, uh, to homicide, for example, then, then that case uh, should not go to a restorative, through a restorative justice process. Uh, but in that case imagine that guy was was uh, was destroyed the guy who, who killed the other guy because it because he never thought about killing a guy it was not is is not a, it was not a criminal at the time uh, and 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 the family of of the dead guy uh, wanted to know what happened right so they wanted to to this was a young guy the one who killed the homicide the, the offender in that case, you send the offender to jail and he'll, lost, he'll be lost forever. And the family will never get any restoration, right? In that case, uh, uh, in that case, actually, uh, uh, the guy who, who, who killed the other guy uh, was same, partially the same of the, the case that Federico said. Uh, through at the end of the restorative justice process, uh, he uh, take responsibility, took responsibility of his crime because he he, he said that uh, he would never thought about killing that guy, but he was guilty of having started the fight, right? Uh, without thinking that that fight could lead to to somebody losing his life. And then finally, he, he, he agreed to take care of the family that of the, the other guy that were old people to help them in all the daily tasks and to also financially support them because the, the guy was working and having bringing back money back at home because the parents were, were poor people, right? So this kind of uh, uh, outcome is actually for everybody, for family, the family will not have any restoration in sending this guy to jail, right? Restoration, a uh, win-win for the, for the offender because he, he will not go to jail and he will, but mainly, that's what Federico said about the, the uh, offenders willing to, to go to jail. is because sometimes going to jail is not even the worst thing because the worst thing, if you are not a real criminal, is to having killed somebody. And, and imagine how all of us will feel if we inadvertently kill somebody. You know, you, you feel destroyed because you are not. So restoration is all for your harm, for the offender harm. And the community is uh, restored because that guy will not go to jail and, and offend again, possibly, because he will not become a, a criminal, right? So it's, uh, there is not, I, I don't see that there is a, a strict uh, uh, definition of which crimes should go to restorative process and which should not. Thank you, Stefano and Federico. We have another question. In fact, this is not a question. This is uh, 
Mr. Vijay Kumar Natarajan recollects the days, he has become nostalgic. He recollects the day, days when he was trained at Mr. Stefano at ICA Commercial Mediation work well in DVC cases, domestic violence cases between the husband and wife and their family members. Your comments on this, sir? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. It was a bad connection. Okay. No, uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar Natrajan. I definitely remember him. Hello, Vijay. I don't see you. I don't see you, but I, I definitely remember of you, of course. <laughs> In fact, he says that um, it, uh, restorative justice would do well working in these cases. The and husband and Definitely. Yeah. Yes, I totally agree. Then you have Bhagya Lakshmi. Uh, she says that restorative justice is perceptible. We need to educate parties to understand and look into perceptible options. How far can it be successful depends on the parties involved. So she wants to comment on this. Say and it she again. Wants to how, far Say it again. It will be effective. how far it will be effective as an ADR mechanism. Oh, I'm not sure I got the question right. Yes. Uh, how far it will be effective as, a as ADR an ADR mechanism? mechanism. Yes. Um, yeah, for for us, it's uh, it's not an ADR mechanism. Actually, it's a it's a new way of thinking. It's a new paradigm. I would not define restorative justice as mechanism. No, but but he's saying that he, he has been muted by somebody. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to. Well, in the sense, it can be seen as a process. But if you look at it that way, uh, it is misleading. So, for instance, uh, the warps uh, in America started in, into the plea bargaining process, but it involved the victims, and, 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 and as well, it sorted out as something different. Uh, as well as victim offender mediation is a diversionary process. But the issue I would just consider in a different, I wouldn't see it as an alternative, but as an appropriate dispute resolution system. So uh, rather than A as alternative, think of A as appropriate. Anytime you have to think of what appropriate is. For instance, somebody uh, recalled the family violence. That is the case in which some kind of peer-to-peer -peer mediation can be done in an effective way. I remember the um, IRCS, the in Criminal Institute in Vienna, they made a study on a peer-to-peer -peer mediation for those cases. So you would have two mediators, a man and a woman, so that you would have the, 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 the two members of the family in a cross section facing one with the other and helping empathy to come out with that kind of dialogue. So that would be an experiment, but, um, but it's not seen just a, a diversionary process. So in that case, they try to experiment the best way to assess that kind of um, of typology of, of, of violence. But yes, so you, 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 have, you have to look carefully at the ADR movement because there is much more uh, philosophy behind it. The ADR is, is to be a, tends to be a little bit utilitarian and that is the risk. Thank you. The Bhagi Lakshmi seems to have raised some questions through mail also to Mr. Federico, mm -hmm. and she requests uh, if it could be answered. What is the, uh, the question? Please, I didn't hear you. Uh, Bhagya Lakshmi seems to have raised certain questions through email. Probably uh, through email? To you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you. I have to look at my email. Yeah. Okay. I saw a question also about the Sharia. Yeah. Is it in the chat? Uh, 
would you like me to say something yeah, about exactly. that? Yeah, exactly. Just spend light on the concept of restorative justice in Islamic Sharia Hello. law. So I'm not an expert. I would I would suggest uh, there are friends of mine from Pakistan who are experts in this. Ali Gohar, for instance, who worked with Howard Zair directly, and Ishaq Israr. I will give you uh, their names. They are really experts, good friends, people involved in the field. Well, um, I don't know if you ever like that kind of law is uh, that there can be problems in interpret in interpretations. So you have a direct derivation from a religious law to a secular law. We in the Western countries have the opposite problem. We have secularized everything and we don't see any transcendence also in philosophical terms. So I think that the issue is uh, from a religious viewpoint uh, is that no man can act in place of God. If you have an idea of transcendence, whatever your faith is, you can never think to be, uh, to have the measure of what justice or injustice is. Therefore, the big issue is to habilitate a relationship and a dialogue. Of course, there are different traditions. We, from the biblical traditions, we know that Moses broke the tables of the law. And this is a big and interesting metaphor of knowing that nothing is written on the stone forever. You have to restore an alliance. You have to restore a covenant, a dialogue also with the divine. So, but, but I'm not going into uh, that kind of religion, uh, religion and that tradition. But surely an openness to transcendence is very important because uh, it enables us to think that we are not absolute. We as human beings. And this is a sheer dimension among every human being. And if you're not absolute, you're entitled to see the other person as a reciprocal. And this is where justice begins. This is the only thing that I would try to say. But if you would like, I, I can send you the context with those experts that are, that are actually draw, um, taking notions from the, for instance, from the Jirga in Afghanistan and that kind of traditions as a peacemaking circles. And the, uh, shall I look at my email now? Uh, you, you, do you send me yes. anything? Okay, uh, but I, I, was it in the Yahoo account? I can't find any emails. Mm. Or can, can you just copy mm -hmm. it, send it in the, in the private chat because I don't see anything in my email. Yeah, we, we'll forward it uh, probably if it is there. We'll forward the mails to you. I don't. I don't find it on the Yahoo. Okay. I'm not, I'm either. If you if you can copy it in the in the in the chat, you can you can select privately my my address and I can see. It. Because from my email, I cannot see it in this very moment. Okay. So there's one question from CNICA. There's one question from CNICA. Please. The idea behind harsh penalties and punishments under the criminal code of a country is to ensure its deterrent nature and no and know how of consequences of criminal conduct would keep would keep others from engaging in such violations of rights of others. Would restorative justice also act as a deterrent? Sorry, can you, uh, can you, uh, yeah. the final See, part of the, the question? Because not the, the final part of the question is, retributive justice system acts as a deterrent. Would restorative justice system, would restorative justice also act as a deterrent? Would it be as, if, as effective? Deterrent for commissioning, for commissioning of a crime. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it, it has the, the same strong power as a veteran as the criminal justice, but I think that uh, it is, uh, we have to go one step back because uh, if we believe uh, in, in the concept of rehabilitation uh, of an offender, 
we should also look into the reasons for which that crime has been committed. Uh, of course, restorative justice uh, is, not, is not aimed to be a deterrent, but it's an approach that is aimed to uh, be educative, inclusive, and to look into uh, not deterrent, but preventive. Meaning that if I, if I look into the reasons for which that crime has been committed, then I may be able to prevent future crimes of that same uh, uh, type by addressing the causes of the crime. This is definitely something that uh, retributive justice is unable to do. On the other term, retributive justice is more deterrent than, 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 than restorative justice. That, that, I, think, I think it's true, but uh, again, it's a different approach. It's a different way of looking at the problem. Thank you, Stefano. I, I don't see any. Give us a different view on this. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Stefano. I don't see any further questions uh, in the chat boxes. You're saying that Federico maybe has a different view on this question, but he's, uh, apparently he's muted, he's muted again. Oh, God, he's muted again. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's because I'm, 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 I mean, giving too long answers. This is the reason why. <laughs> no, 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 no. In fact, we're enjoying the answers. So, so just briefly, for us. briefly, I think that uh, knowing that you have to repair harms can be a deterrent. But go back to our famous philosopher, Beccaria. He, uh, he was, of course, had a different view, but when he was argumenting against death punishment and, and torture, he was showing that violence, violence in the punishment Useful violence. recall the people whose head was cut off. So it, they were just becoming used to witness violence, and this was not a deterrent at all. In fact, frequently violent system produced in Africa. I, I, I had a private question about transformative justice and restorative justice. I will try to be quick in the answer. Uh, I, I don't know what notion of transformative justice you have, but there can be a transformative element in restorative justice in the sense that it helps creating a change into the heart and in the, the perspective of the people involved. And there are approaches that link restorative justice to a transformative approach especially for those situations in which restorative justice is used after civil wars. Think of South Africa. But mm, I would like to focus more on the restorative and reparative element, because if you think of transformation as a goal of restorative justice, you might transform it into a sort of political issue or ask too much from restorative justice. So it is linked to conflict transformation, but I think it's better to keep them separated conceptually and also in terms of the goals that you are looking Thank you for being um, good. Yeah. The, the, uh, could I to the chat box, there are no further questions. But the response, like they say, it's a brilliant presentation. And uh, the and most of the uh, participants here, they have been uh, really enlightened about it. They're thankful to you for this presentation. May I call upon Priya Darshini to uh, present the vote of thanks for today's speakers. So good evening, all. Good evening, all. I take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this seminar 
That was a remarkable, informative, and noteworthy presentation on the topic restorative justice system and mediation. On behalf of CNICA, I express my deep gratitude to Mr. Federico Rico and Sky for accepting our invitation, knowledge, and presence. I'm sure that all the participants have taken note of your suggestions and will be discussing the actions to be initiated within their organization at their levels. A heartfelt gratitude to the wonderful participants who are instrumental in conducting this study series. We are grateful and thankful to our event associate, the Federation of Telangana Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and CSONG for their constant support and presence and making this event successful. My thanks to CNICA for giving me this opportunity to present the order of thanks. Thank you, one and all.